Well, good morning, everybody. It is such a pleasure for me to be here. And right before we get into God's word, I, I do just want to just kind of echo what Pastor Joshua said. God's given me a very unusual ministry. If I could say it's a very unexpected ministry. It wasn't really something I sought for myself, but God just kind of dropped it into my lap, into my life. And what I have is I have a uh, verse-by-verse commentary throughout the entire Bible that uh, some people find helpful, many people find helpful. It's not written for academics or scholars. It's written for everyday believers just like you. So when you have a question about the Bible or you just uh, read your devotional passage and then you want to get a little bit more into the Scripture, you just go to the commentary. You can find it at our website, EnduringWord.com. You can find it on our app where you usually get your apps. You can find it at Blue Letter Bible, uh, which is a great website. Uh, you can get these resources a lot of places. We have a ton of resources on YouTube that you can find just by searching either Enduring Word or my name. And all of this we offer absolutely free just because we want to bless people and because I know a lot more people will use it if I offer it free. And I'm just happy for a lot of people to use it. I do say, though, that I would like to require or at least, let me say, ask one thing of you. Most of the time when I go around and I have the privilege to speak somewhere, I ask people if they would remember to pray for me and for my ministry. And this is why. We see God doing tremendous things through the Bible resources that we offer. Our reach continues to expand all the time. But I think it's because people are praying. And especially what I ask people to pray for is the work that we have of translating my Bible commentary into other languages. Good Bible resources in languages other than English that are free are difficult to find and they're rare. And that's why we've had a very concentrated project to translate my commentary into many languages. Our big goal is to do it into the 10 most used languages of the world. And so we've made a lot of progress in Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, German, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, Farsi, many other languages, and we've even made a start uh, in Swahili. We have uh, my Romans commentary translated that. So if I could just say, please remember to pray. I don't expect a half hour of war room intercession every day, but if you could just make mention in prayer, Lord, bless Pastor David, the work of Enduring Word, especially the translation, I'd really appreciate it. The blessing we see on the ministry, I know it's because people like you pray, and I appreciate it. All right, so Father in heaven, help us now as we give attention to your word. Speak to us, Lord, because we want to listen to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. We're going to take a look at the first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 20. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is God's kingdom of grace. We believe that Jesus is a king, don't we? He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He reigns over everything. And when Jesus came to this earth, and when he began his ministry, the Jewish people at that time wanted a king. They wanted a Messiah. They wanted his kingdom. But here's the difficulty. The kingdom they wanted, and the king they were looking for, was not who Jesus really was. They wanted a kingdom of vengeance against the Romans. They wanted a kingdom of power that would exalt them above the other nations. They wanted a kingdom of prominence that would raise them to glory. And Jesus didn't come to deliver that kind of kingdom to the Jewish people. No, not in his first coming. And that's why Jesus, in much of his teaching, he corrected people's wrong ideas about the kingdom. Now, in Matthew chapter 20, he begins, look at it there, just at the beginning of verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. And Jesus is going to go on to explain in a parable what his kingdom is like. Now, understand, this parable doesn't explain everything about the kingdom. There's no single parable or teaching that could. The, 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 the kingdom of Jesus is multi-layered, it's multifaceted. But this parable that Jesus will tell does a tremendous job in explaining that the kingdom of Jesus is a kingdom of grace. But I think you have to set this up a little bit. 
You know, the Bible has a context. And you know what comes before Matthew chapter 20? Matthew chapter 19. And you know what happened in Matthew chapter 19? A rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus said, Well, keep the commandments. And you know what that rich young ruler said to Jesus? He said, yeah, I've done all that. I wonder, Jesus must have smiled really big when that man said that. Because nobody's kept all God's commandments. But that teacher said he did. Or that rich young ruler, I should say, said he did. So Jesus, knowing what was wrong with this man's heart, knowing what was wrong with his life, Jesus challenged that man. He said, okay, this is what I'm telling you to do. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the man walked away sorrowful because he was very wealthy. Jesus then went on to explain to his disciples how riches can be an obstacle to God's kingdom. Now, sometimes it's very hard for us to believe, isn't it? It's hard for us to see any downside, any negative aspect to having a lot of money. But Jesus warned us, and we need to pay attention to his warning. There are people who will go to hell because they idolize their wealth and their riches. It's an idol to them. It's their God, and they won't give it up to follow Jesus. And Jesus gave that warning to his disciples. And then the disciples started thinking, Peter and the rest of them, they started thinking, You know, we have done what the rich young ruler wouldn't do. Jesus asked us, leave everything behind and follow follow me. And we did it. The rich young ruler didn't. So you know what Peter and the other disciples said to Jesus? They said, hey Jesus, what are we going to get? What kind of reward do we get? And you know what Jesus told me? He said, guys, you're going to be rewarded. I will reward you. Nobody gives up anything for the sake of Jesus Christ and is not rewarded by Jesus, but, and this was a huge qualification that Jesus made, he said, please understand, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. What did Jesus mean by that? It sounds almost like a a cryptic statement. Jesus, what do you mean by that? I tell you, Jesus used this parable to explain what he means by that statement. And this is basically the explanation, is that God will definitely reward anyone who sacrifices something for the sake of Jesus. I'm not talking about if you sacrifice it for your own glory, if you sacrifice it for your own fame, if you sacrifice it for your own benefit, but if you sacrifice anything, your time, your treasure, your talents, you sacrifice it for the sake of Jesus, he will reward you. But the way God rewards isn't necessarily like the way man rewards. So get those fleshly ideas of reward out of your mind. Get those carnal, selfish ideas of reward out of your mind. That's not how God does it. And then Jesus told this parable to explain all of this. And I think it's a beautiful parable showing the principle that God's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. All right, with that long introduction, let me read the text to you now. Matthew chapter 20, and I'm going to read the whole thing. So follow along, picture it, and you side, there you are, you're listening to Jesus there in the region of Galilee. He's going to tell this story. You're looking at Jesus, you're hearing him speak it. Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 1, I'm going to read all the way through to verse 16. Ready? For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, why have you been here standing idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. And he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who came 
were hired about the 11th hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men worked only one hour, and you made us equal, you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a Daenerys? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. What a story, isn't it? Here's a landowner. He owns a vineyard. It's harvest time. I need a lot of workers. So I go down to the place in town where they hire laborers. Hey, I need some workers. It's six o'clock in the morning. Start of the working day. The light is just barely coming up on the horizon. There's a coolness in the air because it's so early. I need workers for my vineyard. Who wants to come and work in my vineyard? Some guys raise their hand. We'll come. Now, he didn't tell them exactly how much he would pay them because he didn't have to. They're going to work a day and they would get a day's wage. In that day, a day's wage was a denarius. Don't bother trying to calculate how much it was. That was just a normal laborer was paid a denarius for a day's work. You're going to come and work starting at six in the morning. Good. I'll give you a day's wage. Great. That's how everybody does it. We're on. The landowner takes them back. They start working in the harvest. About nine o'clock in the morning, he goes, I need more workers. Goes back to where they hire the workers. He goes, I need more guys. Who wants to come? And they go, well, how much are you going to pay us? This way he says, whatever's fair, I'll pay you. Okay, great. They go and they work. 12 noon comes. I need more guys. Goes back. What am I going to pay you? I'll pay you whatever's fair. Okay, great. Three o'clock. I need more guys. And then finally, at five o'clock in the afternoon, He goes back and he hires the last men of the day and he brings them back to his farm. He puts them to work, but they only work one hour. Do you have the situation here? Some guys work 12 hours. Some guys work nine hours. Some guys work six hours. Some guys work three hours. And some of the guys worked only one hour of the day. And then the day was over and they were all going to get paid. And when they get paid... What does the landowner do? He goes, okay, my steward is going to sit at the table and give you all your money, but I want you to line up. And this is how I want you to line up. You, you, you one-hour guys, you're first in line. You 12-hour you guys, you're last in line. I want you all arranged to how long you worked. Okay, great. So the guys who work for only one hour, the five o'clock guys, they come up to the steward's table. They're there to receive their pay. What's your name? Okay, writes it down. How much did you work? I worked an hour. Okay, great. Here's your pay. And they put it in his hand. And what is it? He looks down. And it's a Daenerys. It's pay for a full day's work. Now, do I have to tell you, that's the best day of that guy's life right there. He goes, I wish it could be like this every day. I work an hour and I get paid for a full day. I come in after the heat of the day is gone, after these guys have been tired and sweaty. I I haven't worked enough to raise a sweat. My hands are still clean. I only worked an hour. But I get paid for a full day. And what do you think that guy does? When he walks back, he's going, I got paid for a full day. Here's my Daenerys. And everybody in line sees him and they go, Whoa, that's crazy. So here's the 12-hour guys, the very back of the line. And what are they thinking? They're saying, thinking, oh, man, this landowner is really generous. And if he got paid a full day's wage for one hour work, what are we 12-hour guys going to get? I'm going to get paid for a week. I'm going to get paid for 12 days. This is amazing. I can't wait. They get up to the steward's table. The steward says, what's your name? Here's my name. How much do you work? I worked 12 hours. I was the first one here. And the steward says, here's your Daenerys. How does that man feel? Is he happy? Does that man say, I am so happy for my brother 
who got paid for a full day for one hour. No, what does he say? He goes, I am so angry that he got paid more. What did you say? Now, wait a minute. Mr. 12-hour man, did your employer cheat you? No, he didn't cheat me. I, I came and worked for a day, and he gave me a day's wage. He, he gave me exactly what would be expected. Here's the problem. He was more than generous to the one-hour man, and I don't like that. Friends, here's two principles from this parable. Are you ready? Here's the first principle. God can give completely apart from what people earn or deserve. The one-hour man, did he earn a full day's wage? Nope. Did he deserve a full day's wage? Nope. But the man gave it to him because he wanted to give it. The reason why he gave it was in him. The reason wasn't in the man. That The man didn't give him any reason to give him a full day's wage. He just worked one hour. But he was generous because the reason, the cause for the giving was in the man, the landowner. It wasn't in the man who received it. And he said, God is fully free to give out of the riches of his grace. Friends, do you understand that? Do you appreciate that? That God gives to us not on the basis of what we earn, not on the basis of what we deserve, but out of the riches of his grace. Now, that's a wonderful principle. And might I say, it's because of that principle that we don't go to hell. What would it be like if God treated every one of us according to what we deserve? You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has sinned against God and offended him in some ways. And I don't know, maybe you would uh, comfort yourself and say, well, look, I, I'm not a bad sinner. I know lots of people around me who are much worse sinners. Can I just remind you, there are no small sins before a great God. And every one of us has offended God and his holiness. No, if it's a matter of earning our standing before God, earning our salvation, then every one of us is doomed. But God says in this parable and so many other places in the Bible that his giving to us is a giving of grace. His favor is given on the basis of grace. His blessing is given on the basis of grace. His salvation is given on the basis of grace. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. Now, therefore, God is free to give more to one person than he is to another. Imagine, if you will for a moment, two people. One person is a blessed saint. I bet there's somebody like this right here this morning. I'm speaking to you. You've served the Lord for 50 plus years. You're not perfect, but you've honored God in your life. You, you've served him. You've sacrificed for him. You're a pillar of the church. You're a man or a woman of prayer. You have lived a God-honoring life. Okay, that's one person. Who's the second person? Second person is a rank sinner. Just, they're bad. And yet, in the last hours of their life, they reach out and sincerely repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. Okay, you got those two people in mind? Do they go to the same heaven? Does God have one heaven for the really good and another one for that deathbed conversion? They go to the same heaven. And he said, that's not fair. Well, God's given exactly what he promised to give. If he's being super generous to that person with the deathbed conversion, then that's out of the riches of his grace. Now, let, let me say something very quickly about deathbed conversions. I pray that nobody in this room 
or nobody who maybe hears this message recorded or on video later. I hope that nobody hearing me speak right now is trusting in a deathbed, conve- uh, a deathbed conversion. I was going to say deathbed confession, but deathbed conversion. Don't you trust in that? Because how do you know the circumstances under which you'll die? You may not have the opportunity to trust in Christ before you die. That's very presumptuous to say, well, I'll wait till I'm very old. I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed. I'll go to the same heaven anyway. No, that's a very presumptuous thing. I want you to know that there is one deathbed conversion in the Bible. That was the thief on the cross. That one deathbed conversion is given so that no one would despair, but there's only one deathbed conversion described so that no one would presume. But the truth of it is, those who receive Christ in the last hours of their life go to the same heaven as the saint who has served the Lord faithfully for 50 or 60 years. Now you may say, that's not fair, but may I remind you of something? That if God dealt with all of us according to strict fairness, according to what we earn, according to what we deserve, then there would be no one in heaven. We would all be in hell. It's as if if you were to complain about it, like this man in the parable complained about it. God would look at you and say, okay, do you really want me to treat you according to what you earn and deserve? And if you had sense, you'd say, oh no, Lord, I take it back. I'll live and I'll walk in your grace. Okay, so God is free to give according to his grace apart from the principles of earning and deserving. That's all under the system of works, the system of law. Under grace, we receive from Jesus Christ not by earning and deserving, but by believing and receiving, by trusting Jesus, trusting his promises, trusting his word. But there's a second aspect here revealed by this parable. If this parable is an illustration of the kingdom of grace, it shows us not everyone is happy with God's kingdom of grace. In this parable, was everybody happy? Nope. The 12-hour men weren't happy. I can imagine the 9-hour men weren't happy either. Not everybody's happy with God's kingdom kingdom of grace. Now why? I can think of two reasons. Maybe you can think of several more, but I'll give you two reasons that I can think of why people aren't happy with the kingdom of grace. Why they don't receive it. Why they don't embrace it. One reason is pride. Grace offends pride. Grace says you can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's freely given. Now just receive. Grace gives all the credit to God and none of the credit to me. Zero. Nothing. All I bring to my salvation is sin. God brings his grace, his righteousness, his love. Remember, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He came to establish a kingdom of grace, but that kingdom of grace offends the pride of man. If you're in the position where you say, well, I don't want it unless I can take credit for it. I don't want it unless I can earn it. Then you're never going to get along in God's kingdom of grace. We need to push our pride to the side and say, Lord, I just come to you as a humble sinner. I'll tell you another way that God's kingdom of grace offends the pride of man is it's mentioned here in the parable. It offends the pride of man in that it treats us all equally, and some people don't like that. You know, some people can't be happy unless they are exalted above other people. That's not how it is in God's kingdom of grace. God's kingdom of grace, we are all on level ground at the cross, And friends, sometimes this pride has such a spiritual way of operating. Uh, People get exalted at offices and positions and titles in the church. They really think there's something. They really think that they are the thing and they're on a different level and that you have to serve them and it's all about them and their exaltation. That is not according to God's kingdom of grace. No, that's all about let's have it unequal and some people are more exalted than others. Brothers and sisters, I know 
that if you're part of this church, Calvary Chapel Elderette, God's given you a wonderful pastor. God's given you a whole pastoral team that serves you and pours into you well. But they are not more right with God than you are. They're not on a higher standing before God than you are. They may have different gifts. They may have slightly different calling than you have. But before the cross, they have to come humbly and receive from Jesus just like everybody. Let's get rid of this exaltation of man. It's just like it is in the labor line that Jesus described there. Everybody receives equally. And in the story that Jesus told, that was not pleasing to people. Why? Because of pride. So pride is one reason why many people don't like God's kingdom of grace. But, but I'll tell you another reason. And i got to say, this doesn't have to do so much with not liking the kingdom of grace as it does with not being able to receive it. Some people can't receive the kingdom of grace because of unbelief. Maybe their whole life they've been taught that you're only loved if you deserve it. You're only loved if you earn it. You're only loved if you're worthy of it. Let's face it. That's a lot of the homes that we come from. That's certainly the way it is out in the world. Look, if you're expecting your school to operate on the principles of the kingdom of grace, no, it's not going to operate that way. Hopefully, you're going to get the grades you deserve. When you go to work... Don't expect it to operate on the principles of the kingdom of grace. Your your boss is going to give you what you earn when it's working right. No, no. So we don't expect the principles of the kingdom of grace to really operate, to really run, to dominate at the school, at our work, in the community. But in the kingdom of God, that's how it is. In the kingdom of God... We receive the favor of God. We receive the blessing of God. We receive the salvation of God, not by earning and deserving, but by believing and receiving. But for so many of us, that is entirely a foreign concept. It's a million miles away from us. Maybe we were raised in a very harsh home, a home where very much was expected of us. We were mistreated and made to feel that, well, unless we did everything perfect, we weren't worthy or we weren't loved. Friends, if that's your case, I'm very sorry to hear it. That's not good, but I've got good news for you. In the kingdom of God, it's not like that. In the kingdom of God, You come to God in faith in Jesus Christ. You put your faith in who Jesus is and what he did for you. You put your faith in who he is and what he did at the cross as a substitute for your sin and what he did in his resurrection to gloriously and victoriously rise from the dead. That is your salvation, not anything you do of yourself. This is the way that the kingdom of grace operates And it's glorious. So pride, put it away and come into God's kingdom of grace. Uh, Unbelief, put it away. I know it feels like it's too good to be true. Maybe everything in your past has told you it's too good to be true, to receive a love that's given to you freely just because God is so wonderful. Friends, that's how it is in the kingdom of God. You see, sometimes people get the crazy idea I'm so wonderful that even God loves me. No, 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 no. No, the truth is, God is so wonderful that he loves even me. And I receive it. I believe it. The reasons are in him. I don't have to try to prove myself worthy of God's love. I can simply receive it in faith. Now, when I say those words to you and I talk to you about the grace of God, there's a little voice in the back of my head that gives a little alarm button. Danger, David. Danger, Mr. Preacher. You are going to speak to people and and, and tell them that that God's love is given to them uh, freely by faith. 
that the reasons are in God, they're not in them. You're going to talk to them about the kingdom of grace, and there are people who are going to take that and say, great, then I'm going to go out and live a wicked life, and I can receive all of God's love because it has nothing to do with, with how I live. I don't have to earn it or deserve it. Friends, you know, God, in his kingdom of grace, ha- has addressed that problem. You know how he addresses it? Along with God's saving grace, he gives transforming grace. In other words, if you are saved, you're also born again. You're also transformed. God gives you a new heart. He takes out the stony heart and he gives you a heart of flesh. There's an inner transformation that happens. And I understand all the changes don't happen at once and they're never completely uh, finished on this side of eternity, but there's a change. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And so if a person really does have that heart, Oh, great. It's all of grace. I'll just live any way I want, and then I can receive everything from God because it doesn't matter on what I earn or deserve. I say, listen, I truly doubt that you're born again. I truly doubt that you're saved to begin with. Because when God gives his saving grace, along with it, he gives transforming grace. And something has changed in us to where now we have an instinct that we want to please God. We want to honor him. And it's not like we're incapable of sin, but it won't sit right with us when we do. We'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit and driven to to put those things away in our life. My earnest desire is that each and every one of you would receive would receive the joy, the peace, the confidence that comes from living in the grace of God. If you've been here for a while, I'm sure you've heard Pastor Joshua speak of a man named Chuck Smith. This church is called Calvary Chapel, Eldoret. And because it's connected, going all the way back, not only with hundreds and thousands of churches that are in the world today, but it's connected all the way back to a single church in Southern California that was called Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And the pastor there was this man named Chuck Smith. And Chuck Smith was a man who had an incredible influence. He's had a huge influence on my life in ministry. I know Pastor Joshua's life in ministry and hundreds, if not thousands, of others. One time I was at a conference and I heard Pastor Chuck speak. And this was a story he told. He said, you know, I don't remember my conversion experience. He explained that he was converted when he was a very little boy, three or four years old. You know, his mother very tenderly led him to trust in Christ. He recognized his sin and his mother just in a wonderful way helped him to pray and trust Christ. But it was so young, he didn't remember it. Oh, his mom told him about it. But he said... I don't remember my conversion experience, but then these were the words he said. He kind of looked off into the distance. He got this look on his face that I'll never forget, and he said, I'll never forget my grace experience. And then he went on to explain what he meant. That he was raised in a pretty legalistic church. A a church environment that pretty much said, well, you know, if you don't keep these lists of rules and God's not happy with you. And there was a real division between, in the church, between the people who God was happy with and the people that God wasn't very happy with. And everybody lived under this cloud of uncertainty. It was legalistic. It was a bad atmosphere. And they loved Jesus, no doubt about it. They loved Jesus. But Pastor Chuck, Growing up in that atmosphere and for the first several years of his ministry, having ministered in that atmosphere, he knew what it was like. He knew what it was like to always feel that God was not happy with you, that you fell short, that you were not really measuring up to what God had for you. Not only you received that yourself, but you felt other people around you felt it. It was a bad atmosphere. Until one day, through studying and teaching through Romans, Pastor Chuck had a grace experience and his eyes were open to the truth of the grace of God, which I'll say to you again, that under grace we receive favor, blessing, and salvation from God, not by earning and deserving, but by believing and receiving. 
and it changed his life forever. That's why he could say, I'll never forget my grace experience. I don't know if you've had a grace experience. If you haven't, I pray that you live, you receive, you come to an understanding of it. Now, this is my first visit to Eldoret, but I'll tell you one thing I'm impressed about about your community. Your weather here is great. It, it's really, I bet other people in Kenya and all around the region, they go, man, th- this is a nice place to live because of the weather. And that's awesome. But I don't know, have you ever lived in a place with really bad weather? M- my wife grew up in Sweden. Oh, man. Snow, cold. In the dead of winter, man, you only see the sun. If you see it at all, you see it for a couple hours a day. I know other people, they live in places where it seems like all year long, all day long, it's raining and it's gloomy and it's depressing. And listen, I've lived in some of those places for some of my life and I can tell you what people are like in those things. Those people who live in those places, they fantasize about good weather. They they just like, oh man, I wish. When you live in good weather, like you all do in Eldoret, you take it for granted. Oh, it's another beautiful day outside. Okay, yeah, we get a lot of those. When you don't have good weather, you're aware of it all the time. That's all you can talk about is the weather and how you wish it was better. The atmosphere of grace that you have here at Calvary Chapel Eldoret, it's like living in good weather. It's easy to take for granted. But when people who have lived under law and legalism, and the oppression of all that from the outside, when they come here, they're like, this is an amazing atmosphere. The grace of God is here. Now, it's easy for you all who are regulars, you're like, well, that's what it's like all the time. It's like living in Eldoret with the weather. But don't take it for granted. And remain strong in the grace of God. And if you know people or meet people who are living under the bad weather of law and legalism, then do the very best you can to encourage them in Jesus Christ and to really live in all the benefits of his kingdom of grace. Let me pray. Father, I pray that this would be true of every single person here. I pray, Lord, that every single person here, whether they already know you or whether they don't know you yet, whether they've repented and believed or they have yet to repent and believe, Lord, I pray that every person would put away their pride, put away their unbelief, and that, Lord God, they would come to you trusting in who Jesus is and what he did to rescue them, especially what he did at the cross and in his resurrection. And that they would receive the grace of God, new life and salvation. And that for all of us, Lord, we walk in it, living in your kingdom of grace. Do that among us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.